So, in 2014, I'm driving my children to school. I still do the Brady Bunch thing because I know they're not going to stay with me forever. And I like to listen to them. You know, I've got them in the car, I can't go anywhere. And I, uh, I test their brains. What are you thinking? And so we arrive at the school gate. And my 12 year old son that morning was really quiet. And he said to me, I said, What's going on, Zach? And he said, You know, Mum, can I ask you a question? And I promise you won't get angry. And I'm thinking, Mum, I'm full angry. Never, never, I'm never angry. <laughs> and I said, Go on, go on, Zach, what is it? And he said, Mum, are we terrorists? I'm a terrorist. So I've been asked many questions in my time, and I'm always happy to have a conversation. But for once, I actually didn't have an answer. So I said, Zach, you know what? I'll meet you by the school gate at 3.30, and don't forget to put your lunch order in. And so Raja drives around the corner, and to my surprise, I started to cry. Now, I grew up with six boys and one sister six brothers and one, one sister. So we didn't cry much, we just didn't cry around boys a lot, so we were tough. And, um, and I sat there for a while, and I was asking myself, why am I so upset? Why am I so bothered by this? Why, why, why? And like most mums, we usually say, where did we go wrong? What, what did we miss? And at that time, I was really upset for a couple of days, and I thought to myself, this can't go on. This is not me, this is not the Raja. I'm not talking to myself. I sound like a bit of a psycho to myself. But anyway, I thought to myself, okay, I, I can't be here just sad about this. My son's got something going on. And he's 12 years old. He should be worried about the latest computer games. He should be maybe thinking about girls. He should, or whatever. Um, unusual hair on his body. He's got. <laughs> and my son's asking me whether he is a terrorist. And so began a new journey, something that I actually needed. At that time, I was still going through postnatal. Back in the day, we didn't speak about it. You know, it's okay to talk about it now and say, yeah, you know, times were tough. Muslim people, Muslim women go through postnatal. They get depressed. You know, life affects us. And anyway, so basically I kicked myself out of personal, the personal box and I started to re-engage in community. And when I got back out there, and hence the, uh, the, the sports video, that was one of the first places I went. I did not go to any religious institution. I just wanted to be amongst people from all faiths. I wanted my public school experience today because somewhere along the line I've missed something. Anyway, so um, what I will do is let me take you a bit back into what the narrative has looked like for 20 years of my life. And those 20 years is the years that I decided to wear hijab. Prior to that, I was the official hairdresser of the school. I had the Eiffel Tower fringe and, you know, got into, you know, all sorts of things. But the day that I put that on, everything changed. Most for the better but some was really tough. So I'm going to take you through some of the dialogue. And it goes like this. We're at a function, whatever function it is. And I usually get asked, oh, so did you marry a Muslim man? I say, yes, yes I did marry a Muslim man. But he's really nice, like he's really nice. He's <laughs> He's nicer than me, he doesn't like him. He knows how to cook, you know, his rice doesn't stick together. He's a good man. <laughs> and I'd still get the... Oh. What does that mean? What does that mean? Oh. Anyway, so in questions like this, or along these lines, are you subservient to all your male relatives? And like I say, I can't spell the word, let alone be subservient. <laughs> hey, I'm Aussie, can't you hear the accent? <laughs> anyway, or did you have an arranged marriage? That's the one that I thought. 
I said, no, you know what, truth be told, I forced him to marry me. So, you know, when you have six brothers and a sister, nobody wants to come by, nobody wants to fuck with the pack. So anyway, so that was an interesting time, and I married a lot later than a lot of my friends. Another one would be, are you a nun? Are you a nun? I said, I'm not a good candidate, I swear. <laughs> and I love my nun friends, honestly, they're, they're, they're a hard act to follow. So. Um, probably another one, but the most awkward. This one was the most awkward one. Are you ready? I hope my brother's not in the room. Okay. Um, so, are you circumcised? <laughs> and I say, ouch. <laughs> no. And then with this particular person, I actually turned the question around. And I asked him if he was circumcised. <laughs> and he said, you shouldn't be speaking like that. Oh, I've assimilated. Anyway. Uh, so these are the kinds of things that we've had to answer all the time. And the thing that I think bothered me is that you've missed all the good. You've only focused on the things you know, the stereotypes. You know, what about all the achievements we've got? We're going to university, we're finishing school, we're delaying marriage, we're saying, hey, I can choose my partner. You know, I can choose a career path. I own my own money. I can hold assets in my name. You know, all of these things are achievements that we have experienced here in your system. And anyway, so there's some of the things. That's what's been the narrative. But you know what? We are forgivers. You know, I'm, I'm not prepared to stay and dwell on that. I want to do this. I want to talk goodness. I want to share our lives. What's good for me might not be good for you, but we can still share our lives and our stories. So um, I want to talk about being Australian Muslim today. And you know what, we're, we're proud Australians. And we keep having to justify that. And I pray for the day that we don't have to do that anymore. You know, we respect our ancestry, our faith, our people, um, um, the, the traditions that our parents brought, looking after your elderly, looking after the sick, checking on your neighbours. Make sure you do good, because you've been given so many blessings. You know, all of these things are what we really are. But unfortunately, the focus has been on the one percenters. And if I might say the one percenters are the rat bags. They're the rat bags that make everybody look bad. They're the ones with the biggest mics. They're the ones that always get time to say something. And in fact, they should be silent, because if you can't say something nice, they ain't silent. And anyway, so um, moving on, I just also wanted to mention that Many of us are going through a transition and our kids are smarter than we are and they're asking the questions and they will hold us to account. Why are we believing this? Why are we doing this? And I say, don't believe blindly. Your job is to work out what you're about and when you find that, you're flying. Um, I also wanted to state this. And one thing that's not always shown is there is a, there's a message in Islam that was taught by the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. And I was fortunate enough to be outside his grave a couple of weeks ago. And that message was, if you are not thankful to people, then you are not thankful to God. And that's the message I carry all the time. Thank people, look at people, smile at people, acknowledge what they do. Whether you agree with their lifestyle or not, who cares? Be here for a short period of time. All of this is temporary. And that's the message that I want to bring to you today, that we really have got to mind that gap. And we are not it. We've got to work with one another if we're going to make it work. And I just wanted to also mention that Australia's done a lot of good for our community, and we're acknowledging that. Today I've got my parents here. And my mum's name is Fatima, and my dad's name is Ali. They have probably I don't have a clue what I'm talking about, but anyway. I brought them today because I, I wanted to make this point. They came to Australia with nothing, and they put their family here with support. And my people who didn't say, ah, oh, you're looking a bit different there, can't speak my language, no. When they came to Australia, people opened their doors, and people assisted. We had great teachers, great role models around us. This is what I worry about our future, our kids today. How many role models do they have around them? But they were supported and they put their heads down and they worked really hard. They educated their eight children. 
We are all tertiary graduates, all eight of us. And let's not just say, look at me, look at me, look at me, I'm shouting that, no. The, the, the cherry on the cake of this story is this. Both my parents are illiterate. That's the dream, Australia. The focus wasn't on your identity, the focus wasn't on your attire, the focus wasn't on whether you're good enough, focus wasn't on, um, uh, you know, whether you can work with us or not, it was compulsory. You had to work with us, and we need to go back to that. But I'm really proud of them. They might be illiterate with the word, but they are rich in life experience. So I just wanted to give them a shout out today. In my time, it was termed the identity crisis. There's no crisis here. It's an identity experience. And I'll take the good, and I'll take the bad, and I'm going to mould it into something. And this is my Australian identity. And nobody is going to take that from me. Thank you so much.